So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Catherine Isbister, who um, is actually a Stanford alumni. She did a PhD here in the communications department and then went on to do many great things in, in the game space. And right now she's an associate uh, professor at NYU, both in the computer science department as well as uh, at the game center. And she has wrote many books and did lots of research on uh, game design and character research. She also uh, received uh, a lot of uh, recognition and just to mention one of those is the MIT Technology Review Top uh, Innovators uh, Under 35. So it's a pleasure to have her here. Give her an applause. And Thank you. Forward. So I wanted to start by showing you the context in which I work. This is the Game Innovation Lab at the NYU School of Engineering. And essentially our mission is to explore the technical side of gaming but with an eye toward merging it with aspects of user experience and um, in general, uh, the arts, the humanities, social sciences. So we're, we're sort of clearing house of bringing together lots of people from all over the university to work on building interesting technological experiments with games. Uh, and that's the core of what I do. And I actually gave a talk not long ago in the uh, Human Computer Interaction Lecture Series about some of that work. And I'll touch on that a tiny bit at the end. But this talk is actually based on a book that I'm working on, which gets at the heart of why I got into studying games in the first place. So I wanted to start with my motivation for going into researching games as a grad student. And what happened to me, this was my first job out of uh, college. I was actually working at a zoo in Chicago, Illinois, called the Brookfield Zoo. And I have this problem, which is that I hate birds. I really don't like birds. I've had bad experiences with birds, like birds swooping my head or stealing food from me. And I kind of don't like them. And I would pass through this birdhouse on the way to my office every day at the zoo, and I would see these beautiful birds and this gorgeous exhibition, and quite frankly, it didn't change my feelings one bit about birds. I still do not like birds. But one day, they wheeled this cabinet into the birdhouse, and it had this rather simple at that time, you know, CD-ROM-based interactive experience in which you had to try to survive as a red-winged blackbird for a season. So I had to pick a nest, and then I had to try to find a mate, and I had to you know, go through the tragedy of having something steal my eggs and get really indignant. And I found at the end of playing this pretty bad video-based game, I suddenly had a lot more empathy for birds, and I actually looked at birds in a different way, and I thought, wow, that is really a strange and powerful thing. And having been an English literature uh, undergrad, I sa said to myself, there's something really different about this medium. There's something very, very interesting about interactivity, and I want to try to get to the bottom of that. So, so as was mentioned, I did my PhD here at Stanford, and my dissertation research was actually about how you read little people on the computer screen. So for the older folks in the audience, you may recognize HyperCard here. This is an old prototyping tool. Um, I was not in the computer science department. I was in COM, and you build these simple stimuli to ask these research questions. So my research question was, if a little character on the screen uh, has different body language from the way that it's speaking, um, so in this case, this character is looking confident with its body language, but, but speaking in a kind of submissive way, um, do, the, do those cues, do the consistency of those cues affect how convinced you are by that character? So this was a very simple experimental task. Basically, you crash in a desert, and you have you know, a set of items. You have to rank which ones are most important for survival. And the character would try to convince you about which ones were useful and which ones not. And what I found in my research was if the, if the personality cues of the character were consistent, people would actually change their answers more in their final rankings of the objects than if they were not. So I was able to demonstrate this, this really interesting you know, psychological phenomenon happening that was directly related to these characteristics of this little person on the screen in this very primitive form of interactivity. So from there, I got very interested in where in the world little characters on the screen popped up. And, and video games are one of the main places where interactive characters are welcome. Uh, and I spent a lot of time actually working here at Stanford. I was teaching a class uh, many years back on um, game character design. Um, I spent a lot of time studying what are the ways in which game characters function for people, um, how are they different than other media, and what are the most powerful ways to design and develop them. And I wrote this book, which was primarily aimed at game designers um, rather than everyday folks. 
Um, and I'd be happy to discuss the materials in this book with anyone in the room after if you'd like. Um, but the book that I'm working on now is actually taking a twist on this material and trying to convey to people who may not be game fans, may not be game experts, what is unique and interesting about video game, video games and what they do for us emotionally. And it's part of this playful thinking series from MIT Press. Um, and the aim of the book series is uh, for people to take a strong stance about something about video games and then uh, construct an argument that is useful not just to people within the field, but also to people who are just everyday folks, like somebody who listens to NPR who, or who you know, might read The Times or Scientific American, somebody who's a curious individual who wants to understand what's going on with games and why they're interesting and valuable. Um, so what I wanted to do today with this talk is actually float that material past you as an audience and get your response to it. So this is the book I'm working on during my sabbatical year, and it's my attempt to take some of the work I've done over these many years and take it to an, to an audience to help people understand. I think there's been some rather destructive dialogue about games over the years and their emotional impact and um, some interesting culture war stuff going on recently. So I'm hoping that this book will, will be a nice intervention to sort of point out an, an aspect of games that, that is very dear to me. So here's the core premise of the book. The core premise of the book is that game designers have developed new techniques for evoking powerful social emotions in players that are not found in any other medium. So basically making the argument that games have some really interesting and unique abilities to evoke emotion in people that we should value as an incredible addition to the, the, the toolkit that we have in media for playing with feelings. Um, so, of course, before I get into what these unique properties are, you know, for those of you who are, you know, very definition focused, I wanted to, to put out there, you know, the working definition of game that I'm, I'm dealing with. Um, there are lots of definitions of games. I'm taking one from Jesper Yule's book, Half Real. Uh, a game is a rule-based system with variable and quantifiable outcome where different outcomes are assigned different values. The player exerts effort in order to influence the outcome, and the player feels emotionally attached to the outcome, and the consequences of the activity <coughs> are optional and negotiable. So I bolded the part that I care about particularly, which is that what I find interesting about games from an emotional point of view is that you take actions, they have consequences, you have goals as you go into those actions, and that sets the stage for a very different kind of emotional capability of games as a medium than other media. And in that sense, I would characterize games almost more like a sport than like any other kind of passive medium. And I threw this up there just, just kind of for humor value. I mean, games really are a sport, right? They actually are a sport. And what's funny is when you look at this, this is like an, a photo of very, a, a, an action-packed eSports event. But when you look at what's going on there, as somebody who doesn't understand that world, you might look at that and say, oh, it's a bunch of people watching something on a screen. It looks more like movie viewing or TV viewing to you than something like a sport. But when you get into what's actually happening for people when they're playing a game, it's much more like, say, running a 5K race. You know, you embark on playing, you, you embark on playing the game, you're, you're in the playing field with others, you're taking actions, you have you know, outcomes you're hoping for, you have skills you've mastered that you may or may not be able to pull off in that particular instance of, what's, of gameplay. Um, it's much more similar to playing a sport for the person who's actually involved in the gameplay. Um, and that means that the kinds of emotions that are being evoked are quite different. So game designers are working with emotions that unfold as people take action. And one of the most important theories they've drawn on in understanding what's going on for players emotionally is this notion of flow. And how many people are familiar with the theory of flow? So a lot of people are. For people who are not, this comes out of the psychology literature and from studying optimal experience. And some folks, Chixit Milhai and others, came up with a set of criteria for understanding an optimal sort of experience, a flow experience, that can happen to someone that's very pleasurable and engaging. And um, games are known to evoke the flow state. Um, this diagram is actually from Genova Chen's master's thesis, and he's one of the folks that worked on um, Journey and Flower and other very well-known games from USC. Um, but he, among many other game designers, has spent a lot of time looking at 
how maintaining the right amount of challenge uh, to a person's abilities can keep them in this sort of pleasant hedonic state. And if the challenge gets too high, you can create anxiety or frustration. If the challenge is too low, you can create boredom. So a lot of discussion about emotion in games has cycled around these feelings that have to do with you know, basic goal setting on one's own in the environment. Um, I also wanted to reference another important emotional model that's come more out of, uh, not so much out of theory, but out of working practice. So this is Nicole Lazaro's four fun keys model of emotion. And this, this model is, is, is also uh, centered on people taking action in games, but it's, it's based on taxonomies of the kinds of actions people like to take in games and the sorts of fun they want to have. Um, so she characterizes different kinds of, of player styles, and she's going back to work by people like Richard Buttle. So certain kinds of people like really difficult fun. So, so they need extremely challenging situations, and they are going for this funny razor's edge balance between intense frustration and incredible triumph and relief. And other people don't like that kind of fun. They like to explore. They want to feel curiosity. They want to feel these more gentle feelings that go along with moving around through a terrain and understanding a possibility space. Um, so this is another way of looking at feelings and how they're evoked in games. And these have been the primary, primary ways that people have talked about emotion in games. The stuff that I want to bring to the table is actually consideration of social emotions. And specifically looking at, because I think a lot of times people think of games as antisocial, and, and you could take this flow state idea and kind of say, oh, well, that's kind of drug-like. That's sort of creepy. You know, do I want people to be in that state all the time? But I have actually observed that games also very powerfully emo ev evoke social emotions in people. And I want to explore that in this book. So there's been actually a lot of discussion within the game design community about how games do this and the fact that they do this. And it's frustrating to me that it hasn't made it further out into the everyday public's mind. Um, so this is a quote from Will Wright, who's a very famous game designer who worked on, among other things, The Sims, which is one of the, the biggest franchise PC games of all time. So he says, people talk about how games don't have the emotional impact of movies. I think they do. They just have a different palette. I never felt pride or guilt watching a movie. So at the time he made this comment, actually, there was a sort of funny... Uh, envy going on of, of cinema by games. I think we've moved past that period, but I think, I think the comment stands, and I think this is where uh, the heart of the thing is that I want to surface. So he tells a story, actually, of when he first played this game, Black and White Creature Isle, and this is a screenshot from that game. So in this game, the player has a creature that he trains, and that creature acts as a go-between uh, with the villagers in the game world. And so, the interesting thing is the player can mold an evil creature or a kind creature, and the way that you mold an evil creature is you actually are mean to this little character. And you like slap it around, and you punish it, and you, you know, give it arbitrary rewards, and you just make it feel bad. And he talks about how when he first got a hold of this game, he instantly started experimenting with the system, and he was like, oh, wow, and he started slapping his creature around, and then he felt really horrible and guilty. And he was like, whoa, that is so weird. Why am I feeling guilty about this? What's going on for me? So if you unpack this, looking at the psychology literature and the research about how we form emotions, the ways that we form emotions, we, of course, we have plans and ideas of what we want to accomplish in the world. Um, and we have expectations about the world. But we're also getting information all the time from the environment and from our own bodies. So part of how we're deciding how we feel is through the actions that we take and what those actions mean to us and what those actions signal to us about our intents. So the interesting thing about games is games, by leading you into certain kinds of actions, activate your emotions through your actions, not just through your intentions and not just through watching somebody as they play along. Uh, watching somebody in a movie, say, and following along with what they're trying to do. So, so even though he's, his intent is to just explore this game system, once he starts slapping this creature around and the creature has a reaction to what he's done, you know, part of what's going on in his emotional labeling of what's happening is, I was doing something to that creature, so I am, I am involved in what that creature's feeling, so therefore 
I feel bad. And I can't move forward without a shout out to the media equation, which was my advisor's book along with Byron Reeves, who's still here on the faculty. And they ran a series of brilliant experiments, very, very s s dumbed down, sort of simplified social situations with computers in which they were able to evoke social responses. So things like if a computer was especially polite and helpful to you, you would literally do it more favors at the end of the study than, than not. Um, so, so they basically pointed out this thing, which I, I do believe is true about us, that when a medium evokes, acts social, we respond to it as if it's social. And so I think games have this wonderful set of tools for working with that material. So I'm going to take you through a set of examples. Um, the first one is a game called Train, and it's actually a board game. Has anybody here seen or played Train? Okay, Henry has. So this is um, a game created by Brenda Bracewaite Romero, and this game actually won a Vanguard Award at Indicade. And Brenda has this series of games that they're called The Mechanic is the Message, and she's explicitly trying to explore the emotion of complicity. She, well, not the, the, the situation, the feeling of complicity. So what happens in train is players are trying to move train loads of passengers from one place to another. And they're dealing with all these obstacles and challenges along the way. And then it's only at the very, very end that you come to find out that what you were actually doing was sending everyone to Auschwitz. Okay. And some people realize kind of as they're going along, they look at the materials and they're sort of playing along and they sort of realize, whoa, wait a minute, this is kind of reminding me of something. And then they will start trying to you know, save as many people as they can as they go along. Um, whether or not they do this, almost all players have an incredibly powerful emotional experience from this game. And Brenda says, ultimately, I think the power of a game lies in its ability to bring us close to the subject. There's no other medium that has this power. I saw people cry over train, not just once, but multiple times. People watching, playing, those trying to save the passengers. That's powerful, and it's the medium that does that. So what I think is very clever about train is it takes the sort of pleasure-seeking part of your brain that's trying to uh, figure out the structure of the game and master it, and it, and it puts it on a collision course with the realization that the social frame of this game is, is this very loaded historical situation. And I think it, it tricks the mind into reconsidering what may have been happening to people as they were living through that situation. So she's using the agency embedded in gaming in a very interesting way to create very different kinds of emotions that I would argue you, you don't see um, in something like watching a film about this topic, for example. So that's a board game. When you get to digital games, there are actually some very concrete tools that game designers have come up with for sort of hurrying these processes along. So one of the very powerful ones is avatars, the notion of a player character. So when you're playing, not all games, but many games, you may be given a character that represents you on the screen. Um, let's take snowboarding as an example. So if you're inhabiting this snowboarding character as a player, um, First of all, as you're going along, and you're, even if you're working with a controller, you're sort of through the game feel, you're sensing the environment, you're getting this kind of kinesthetic connection to the environment through manipulating your avatar. You're also problem solving with the abilities that this avatar has to offer you. So you're starting to inhabit the problem solving mind of this avatar. And you're sort of taking on this social and fantasy persona of this avatar as you play. So you're imagining yourself as this famous snowboarder, you know, maybe you're actually inhabiting uh, the character of, you know, these days in sports games, they often take actual statistics from real athletes so you can literally inhabit their skill set as you go along. So this is a really powerful way to create feelings in people. And I'm going to give you another really strong game example that illustrates this. This is, a, this is an older art installation game that actually Henry curated an exhibition that this game was in. Um, it's called Waco Resurrection. And it was created by an arts collective in Los Angeles. And, and this game was built, similar to Train, it was built to explore the siege that happened in 1993. It was a, it was a religious commune in Texas. And at, at a certain point, the government raided this commune and a, a lot of people died. It was very controversial. Um, so this arts collective decided to use essentially a shooter game engine to create 
a way to explore what the situation might have been like. And they put you into the avatar of David Koresh, who was the cult leader. And um, it's a third person, so you're actually seeing the avatar over the shoulder rather than you know, the typical first person. Um, and they, they created an immersive visual and soundscape that evoked what was going on in that situation. They had the sound of FBI negotiators and battle sounds, and they also intermingled with that things like you know, the voice of God, because this was a religious cult, so to speak. Um, and they included things like the, the disruptive noises that the FBI played, or sorry, the, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, that's who came in. Um, the the, the, the d sort of drill sounds and animal screaming sounds that that organization played when they went in and raided the place. So it's not just the visuals, it's also the actions. So when, you, when you're running around in this game, you um, have sort of power-ups that evoke what was going on in that situation. Um, you can do things like, um, you know, what is the, you can radiate a charismatic aura. That was one of the examples that was kind of interesting. And, and another thing that, that this group did was they took this out of the digital world and they actually created these helmets for players to wear when they were playing in the art installation that looked like David Koresh's face. So they sort of further created this mask and this performance of the avatar. And some of the commands that were power-ups you would speak in order to have that power-up. So Edo Stern had this to say about the game and its power. One of the differences in making a game about an historical event is the nature of identification and implication. Games require the user to act and as such appear to implicate the player in the actions of the avatar they're controlling. This is rather obvious but does create new emotional experiences. Imagine a documentary about Hitler versus a fictional film with an actor playing as Hitler versus a game where the player plays as Hitler. The most common criticisms we heard about Waco were that the game is in bad taste, that the game is exploitative, that the game was pro-Davidian, pro-Koresh. The bad taste and exploitation criticism stem from people struggling to consider that games can be made about serious issues while still providing some ambiguity. The second criticism of the game being politically skewed assumes that Koresh is a protagonist, a hero in the game, is a unique issue that games reveal, as a film about Hitler would likely not draw this criticism. So as an artist, he felt like this was a very interesting way to project people into a situation and play with this notion of imp being implicated in or empathizing with a situation in a powerful sense. Okay. So here's another example of a game with a very different style of avatar. It's doing a different kind of work. This is a game called Cart Life. And this game won several awards in the 2013 Independent Game Festival. Um, it was developed by a guy named Richard Hoffmeyer, and he describes this as a retail simulator. Has anybody here played Cart Life? No? Nobody. Okay. Have you played The Sims? Some people. Okay. Simulators are basically, um, at some level, simulating some aspect of real life in a way that is um, obviously more interesting and playful than real life is. And in this case, you, uh, you get to choose between three different uh, food cart vendors. So basically what you're trying to do is survive as a food cart vendor um, in a city like New York. Um, and as, as, and this, is, this is from a, a reporter speaking about this game. Um, a young mom trying to provide for her daughter, a Ukrainian immigrant hoping to make a new life, a well-traveled bagel chef who can't bring himself to walk away from the white-knuckled intensity of the food service industry. The heroes of cart life are anything but your typical video game protagonists, doing their best to get by in a world that doesn't make it easy. By putting you in the shoes of these three individuals and letting you share in their struggles, cart life becomes a moving ode to the trials and tribulations of regular people who work themselves to the bone day in and day out just to get by. So literally what you do in this game is you change your prices and you get to know your customers and you pick out where you're going to have your cart, these sort of mundane aspects of running something like a food cart. But along the way, you, you get little bits of the character's life. And actually a lot of how that happens is through these um, people they have relationships to. So for example, um, Melanie, who's one of the vendors, has a daughter, and she's recently gone through a divorce. And one of the things you have to do in the game is you have to show up every day to pick Melanie up from school. And that's a high stakes thing because you're going through this custody battle with your husband. So it, it knits together very nicely your personal responsibilities to another sort of, you know, virtual other into the game mechanic and into what's going on for you. Um, so that leads me to the next 
primary innovation that game developers have come up with to, to play on people's social emotions, which is these virtual people. Um, and, and in this game, they're mostly implied. You're not really interacting with them. But I want to show you an example of a game where you're, the whole thing is all about interacting with a virtual person and the work that this can do for players. So these are, th these are screenshots of this game called Love Plus. How many people have heard of the Love Plus series of games? Not, nobody, okay. So these are dating simulations, okay? And they're a very popular genre in Japan. And there's a range of different kinds of dating simulators. Some of them go into the erotic. This one is not in that territory. It's actually kind of a, a sweet high school romance kind of a dating sim. Uh, and so basically the way this game goes is there are three girls and interestingly, these girls have been there throughout the whole series of these games. There is, um, let's see, Nene, Manaka, and Rinko. So Nene is sort of an older sister type. She's a year ahead of the player in school, and he meets her at his part-time job at a restaurant after school. Monica is a wealthy, sporty girl who plays a lot of tennis, who's also a year older than him. And Rinko is younger and more shy than the other two. So they all have a kind of a persona. You get to choose who you are going to try to convince to go out with you. And you have to court these girls. You have 100 games within the day, 100 days within the game to actually succeed in charming the person that you're interested in going out with. So you can choose four actions to take per day. And these are a mix of actions that build up your own personal characteristics, like your health, your knowledge, your charm, those sorts of things and also openings for reaching out to the different girls. Like where will you, will you try to talk to them? Will you, you know, sort of initiate something through their friends? That sort of thing. Um, then, w once you've actually succeeded, the game doesn't end. It goes into a whole new phase, which is you're dating this character. And, and this can just go on and on. And there's these Im an amazing amount of content in this game. Um, there are, um, there's a text messaging system. You can call your girlfriend, you can schedule dates. There's a, there's a karaoke bar in the game that you can go to several times and she'll do different songs. You know, if you go several times, she sort of loosens up and will do other sillier songs she wouldn't do before, that sort of thing. There are you know, movies, events, you know, horoscopes, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, so this is really an amazing depth of interaction with one artificial human being, right? And you might think to yourself, well, what, what is so compelling and interesting about that? Well, actually, people find it incredibly compelling and interesting, and sometimes so compelling and interesting that they want to carry it over into real life. So there was actually a guy at, at one point in Japan who decided he would, he would have a public wedding between himself and his character, and then he went on a honeymoon with his character in Guam, and there are these pillows you can buy that look like your character. So there's this whole funny phenomenon around this. I mean, and, and we can laugh, but you know, if you think of an analog in, of, of romance novels, say, in the US, and people who read romance novels over and over again, um, and you talk to people who play these games and who take it all the way to this level, and one of the things they say is, there's a comfort and a predictability and a sweetness in my relationship with this character. I know that if I do the right things, I'm going to have this this connection and I'm going to have this loyalty from this character. So, uh, so particularly people who feel kind of socially challenged and struggling with managing something like dating in real life, it's a nice way to have a feel for or a flavor of what that might be like were they to get to that place. So this is just to show you that there are already game genres that do a really great job of creating nuanced emotional situations and feelings for people making use of non-player characters. Um, so so that's, that's gameplay alone. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about gameplay with others because that, that shifts what's possible with these tools. So once you're, once you're playing with other people, um, avatars can actually do very different emotional work. Um, it goes from you sort of trying on a persona and we think about, you know, something like the Waco situation, like kind of exploring on your own some character you might not play in everyday life or, you know, being a, a, a wonderful athlete, to getting to try on a different social persona with other people. And the amazing thing about games is that games can actually deliver powers to you along with the appearance of another persona. So a great example of this is City of Heroes, which was a massively multiplayer online game that ran for a number of years. 
And in this game, the premise was that everybody was a superhero. Okay, and so when you, when you went in to play this game, you got to select an avatar for yourself that gave you certain physical powers, superpowers in the game world, as well as highly customizing your appearance. So anybody, an MMO player here? A few people, okay. So massively multiplayer online games, they bring lots and lots of people together, and one of the ways that they're typically constructed is they have these different types, classes of characters, and choosing a class chooses the kinds of powers, roughly speaking, that you have. So this game had classes like other games, um, but then layered onto that was also um, origin stories, and origin stories added another layer of, um, of powers to you, but also hooked deeply into traditional superhero origin stories, so you could choose between science, mutation, magic, technology, and natural. So you think about the kinds of super, like you could pick, you know, you know did you get bit by a radioactive spider, or you know, are you basically MacGyver, right? Like what, what, where did your powers come from? Um, so both of those sets of choices were very enmeshed into actual gameplay activity, but then on top of that in the game, and this is what I'm showing below, you had a very involved um, character avatar editing system where you could create highly customized the look of your avatar. And then the last piece of it was you got to actually have a little description of yourself that was, it was just as simple as when you clicked on the character you'd see this, these couple of phrases of description, um, but that combined with this editing capability created this amazing range of personas, people running around being. So I'm going to read you, so, so when the game shut down they had this sort of you know, nostalgic uh, discussion going on online, and here, here are some of the descriptions people had for characters that they posted, their all-time favorite characters. Melissa Kane, formerly a teacher in a school for super-powered children, now a revenant out for revenge. So that's one. Thunderblitz, psychotic and omnicidal cyborg made from the DNA of a narcissistic supervillain. Steampunk, steampunk technology empowered by an arcane reactor stolen from the Circle of Thorns. That other kid, stuntman, who after too many knocks on the head believes that she's actually a superhero, runs around Paragon City waving a katana and quoting Quentin Tarantino movies. Uh, organized mime, he was an evil mime who was super strong and awesome to play. And then the last one, the Hundred Acre Hood, oh bother. So, so basically people could run around engaging in these personas with each other and sort of tap on each other's uh, avatar and see this incredible backstory and then choose to sort of play out that backstory with one another, right? Like use the territory of the game to craft a mutual fantasy. So beyond being a mask for people, avatars in game worlds, because they're kinesthetically grounded, also allow people to engage in collective action, okay? And as human beings, we're wired to learn how to coordinate physically with one another and to take pleasure in that, and that is a part of how we build trust and liking with one another is doing physical tasks with one another. And I think one of the kind of unfortunate things about modern life is we don't do that perhaps as much as we used to. And it turns out that multiplayer video games are a very interesting place where people take very rich, coordinated action together. Um, and that, I think, creates very interesting emotions between people. So, so I'm going to use Little Big Planet as an example here. This is a platformer game that can be played among uh, four different people, either in the same room or also on the network. And this game has very simple avatars. They were called Sack Boys and Sack Girls. And you could customize them at a superficial level. But what was really amazing about these avatars is that with the joysticks on the PlayStation 2 controller, you could do sort of slapstick you know, silent film acting, basically. You could, you could have very visible emotional reactions to things, um, and you can see some of the range here, and you can move their little arms around. Um, so, what you do in Little Big Planet is you, you try to solve puzzles together, and you have to work together in order to do them. Um, so if you're in the same room, you can talk about the puzzle. If you're, if you're, if you're in different places, you, you have to sort of gesticulate and find other ways to work together on the puzzle. And people evolved these really interesting both ways of signaling to one another using their avatar's gestures, but also ways of just doing kind of slack, slapstick comedy on the side. So I'll, re I'll read you a quote from one of the players. Helen calls them the hurrah buttons, L2 and R2 plus both analog sticks held upward. 
Whenever she wins the most points on a little big planet level, she presses these buttons and her grinning sack girl lifts both arms in the air in wordless celebration. My sack boy, meanwhile, tends to scowl and storm off the side of the screen, fists clenched. Or after a particularly stressful level, he might pull out a frying pan and hit Helen's sack girl on the head. Helen tends to take losing slightly better. She will drag my sack boy away from the camera, mid-disco dance, in a vain attempt to take the spotlight. Either way, nigh every level ends in a comical scuffle between our characters without a word spoken between us in the real world. So that's a really interesting thing that's happening for people. They're sitting there together playing this game, and then they're doing this really subtle, silly slapstick with each other using these avatars. And I would argue that's, that's an experience you can't really have with any other medium. It's a very, very interesting and bizarre thing that avatars, avatars can do in crafting social feelings. Um, in contrast, this game, um, this is an actual collective action game in a collective action situation. This is a game uh, built by Anna Antropy, who's an indie game developer, to deploy at Occupy Oakland when the Occupy movement was going on. And um, she put it into a, a console that was dragged into the area that people were going to occupy. And the game had a very simple mechanic. It had a series of, of gates that could be unlocked as you traveled upward through the game space. And, and you could walk up to the, um, to the machine and you could you know, initiate play and you would be sort of assigned an avatar with a certain color and there were lots of different ones. So um, you could come back to the machine later and go, oh yeah, it was the purple one and then move yours further forward. So, so each avatar would try to work to unlock gates and keep the, the whole group moving upward in this game. Um, and so, so this game was, was meant to give people at this, this activist movement something interesting to do that sort of echoed and reinforced what they were trying to do in the real world. Now, interestingly enough, this, this protest actually ended in a kind of violent police action. <laughs> so they had to haul this thing away and put it in a truck and, you know, not too many people got to play it. But, but I think this is, you know, I'm just trying to give you a broad sense of the possibility space here of how avatars can be deployed in a social setting. I'm almost done here. Um, did Robin talk at all about Journey last week? Yes, yeah, she did. Okay, so Journey is another great example. This game um, provides its only network play, and um, you can't talk to the person you're supposed to collaborate with. And so uh, they crafted really beautiful and subtle interdependencies between players that happen. You know, I think you can only make these little chirping noises. And, uh, run around with each other, and similar to what happens with Little Big Planet, people talk about this being one of the most sublime aspects of playing Journey, like discovering that they needed to depend on someone else in order to get through the game, and you know, realizing that in a, in a very artfully crafted environment designed to make you feel a sense of awe and a sense of humbleness. Um, so this is another example. Um, games can also create worlds that are mostly private worlds that other people can occasionally visit and cre can create strange interactions that are oddly socially intimate as a result. So Animal Crossing, has anybody played Animal Crossing? Okay, a couple of people have. So this game, uh, it, you, you basically, you're in this little village of animals and you, you get your own house and you, you buy things and you tend the garden. It's a very domestic and cozy sort of world. And so, um, with, the, with platforms that had you know, shareable like wireless and other ways to, to communicate between devices, they started to implement these ways that you could go and visit other people's houses in this game. So you would primarily play this game by yourself, but then occasionally you would go and visit somebody else's house. And I want to read you this, um, this review. So, so, so this is a review by a game uh, journalist who is talking to the people who made the game as, as a new version is coming out. So he says, it had been raining in my virtual hometown. It was raining in Kyogokus. This is, this is the co-creator of the game. More coincidence. I stepped off the train, and here were two of the game's creators as little Animal Crossing people. Kyogoku directed me to some objects outside the train station. They were at my feet. I left you some gifts, she said. There were baskets of fruit. There was a present wrapped in special wrapping paper. She encouraged me to open the gift. It contained carp streamers, a gift that only Japanese gamers were slated to receive from the game on Children's Day in early May. I'd never have unlocked it in my American copy of the game. We'd found ourselves a good bullet point. She suggested that players can, could benefit from connecting to gamers in other countries to get items offered only in those regions. This wasn't a mere tour, obviously. It was a friendly sales pitch with gifts. 
we all casually walked past a flag that just happened to have a Kotaku logo on it. That's the paper he was writing the piece for. Flattery. Later, they sent me a QR code to generate it. He goes on to describe the strange feeling of touring Kyogaku's own house in the game. We wound our way through the town. I kept snapping screenshots with my 3DS. We headed over to Kyogaku's primary home. She went inside. Eguchi stood by the mail mailbox. Just go in? Yes, they told me. This was weird because I'm a mere Animal Crossing dabbler, maybe because this felt weirdly intimate. It felt different than hanging out outside in the virtual rain. Yes, we were playing a game. They were clearly trying to hype its features and generate a positive story. But I suddenly felt it was imposing. Homes are private places. Walking into another person's, particularly that of the person who made the game, felt like a big step. Of course this wasn't really a home. I was just buying into the metaphor more strongly than I'd expected. So I think this example nicely shows how when games control context, they can recreate social situations that very powerfully resonate for us when we engage with them in a virtual space. So I want to finish. I mentioned at the beginning that in my lab we primarily do technologically based work. And I wanted to show you, you know, one of the through lines from thinking about things in this way to the kind of design experiments we do. Um, so I wanted to mention a game that I've been working on with my artist in residence at the lab. So this is actually, these, this is a photo series done by a wonderful photojournalist documenting people and their avatars in games. And I can track down the reference for anybody who wants it. It's just amazing what what he shows. So Kaha was very inspired by the fact that people build these personas in these worlds. And she wanted to see if people could do that. If we start to instrument them and their bodies in the physical world, would they do that? Would that, would that sort of thing happen in, in the real world? So she, is, so she and I launched on a project called Costumes as Game Controllers. And she was very inspired by this, um, this show. I don't need any sound on this. The Common Writer show in, that was in, famous in Japan. I mean, I think it's still going on. Um, what interested her about this show is that um, people would have these superpower costumes, but in order to actually activate your superpowers, you would have to strike a pose, a very special pose. And so she was really interested in okay, if we're going to put stuff on the body, how can we get people's bodies involved in this transformation into this character? Is there some way to do that? And in particular, she wanted to create a sense of connection between people. So not just I'm my own superhero and I'm charging off, but you and I are interdependent superheroes, kind of like you know, the Wonder Twins or something. So she has been building this game um, that uses costumes as the controllers. And she, she worked from this myth in Japan of lightning bugs sort of fighting together to fight off the forces of darkness. So she envisions the players as lightning bugs that have to collaborate and work together. And she designed two different wear wearable elements. Um, here's, a, here's a detail shot of one of them. Each of them has a mobile phone embedded in it. One player wears this gauntlet, which is shown here. And that's Kaho, by the way. And the other person wears a backpack. And I'll show you a little diagram <laughs> of how it works. So basically, oh, you can't see the, the people. It's too light. OK, so I'm, imagine two people standing there, because I'm, I'm seeing shadows on my. Uh, so one person has the backpack on and the other person has the gauntlet. And in order to activate their interaction, they have to hold hands, OK? So the person who has the backpack, they have to do these hand motions in order to gather energy. As they gather energy, the lights in the backpack um, illuminate. And when they have enough energy, the person with the gauntlet says, OK, and then you hold hands. And the person with the gauntlet takes aim and starts to get rid of the darkness in the environment. So the whole thing involves physical performance and also involves donning this costume. So we have been testing and iterating many forms of this. This, this was um, initially she had built this you know, projection dome to sort of envelop people in the play experience. We found that that was a little overwhelming. Um, but when we, I wanted to mention this play test we ran. My daughter was there. That's my daughter on the, on the top one. And um, she played this with a little boy she'd never met. And after the game, she said to me, I think I have a crush on that boy. <laughs> I mean, she was like seven, and I just thought that, more than, that shows you the power of physical connection, right? That, that the act of hand-holding was, was so powerful for her in fighting the enemies together and sort of gave me a lot to chew on in terms of thinking about this project. Um, so more recently, we've been iterating on this game to put most of the attention back on the body. So there are lights that activate as people you know, power up, and, and so they know when they've actually been shooting at the enemies and things are happening. 
and we've, we've begun documenting uh, play sessions at our play tests by taking before and after snapshots of people and looking for physical traces of connection and transformation. And it's interesting to see if you, you look at the first shot of the two people who played, and this was at the TEI conference here in January, you know, they're just sort of smiling, posing together. After they play, um, they're often doing poses that are reminiscent of what they were doing in the game. And this is just literally, can, can we just take a quick snapshot before you leave? So, um, very interesting, potentially transformative experience. So that's just to show you that you can take these insights about these unique properties that games have and then start to move them out and consider how they might mor morph and transform you know, as, as we have different kinds of technologies that enable play experiences. So that is my, that's, those are the examples supporting my argument. I'm really interested to see if you all believe that games have, now that you've heard all this, that they have unique powers in evoking social emotions in players that are not found in other media. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.